John Calvin once said, to paraphrase John Calvin, he once said that we have a genuine church wherever the word is preached, sacraments rightly administered, and where there's discipline. He said those things constitute a genuine church. When we have items of gold or silver or platinum even, those items are usually stamped with hallmarks that tell us that they are the, the real thing, that those items are what they say they are. They have a quality about them if they're marked with these hallmarks. Well, tonight, we're going to take for granted to a degree what Calvin said, that here we have in Zion Baptist Church, a genuine church, where the word of God is preached, where the sacraments are rightly administered, that is the Lord's Supper and baptism, the only two, there are no others. And if anyone tells you that there's any more, then they belong to the wrong church. There's only two, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And where they are, that's part of the genuine church. We accept that here in Zion. And discipline also exists here when it needs to be expressed or exercised. But tonight, we're going to take that for granted, that that's the way we are in Zion Baptist Church. Not because we think much of ourselves, it's just that we're going to be looking at something different. We're going to be taking a look at signs, not so much simply of a genuine church, but of a healthy church. And we're going to be looking at that through these four hallmarks that we saw in Acts 2 and verse 42. The first of which is a commitment to the word of God. The second is a commitment to fellowship. The third is a commitment to the breaking of bread. And the fourth is a commitment to prayers. So that's what we're going to be looking at tonight, because that's what shows the church to be healthy when these things are happening in the fellowship. So what's the first of these? The first of these we find at the very beginning of the verse, verse 42. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Who continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine? Well, the previous verse tells us, them that gladly received the word from Peter, who were baptized the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So it's these 3,000 people. It's, these, it's the church with this 3,000 added to them. They were all devoted to the apostles' doctrine. They continued steadfastly. This early church, they were diligent in the word of God. They were eager for the teachings of the apostles. There was a deep devotion. That's what it means. It's, it, there was something in these new believers. There was something in these early believers that they knew that they needed and they wanted the Word of God. There was no going forward without the Word of God. There was no advancement without the teaching of the apostles. And they devoted themselves to a true devotion, complete dedication, submitting themselves to the Word of God. Well, that's what we need to do. Thank the Lord we are a church that loves the Scriptures. 
that we are a church that loves to hear the, the word of God proclaimed, who love to st- study the word of God and think about the truth of what God is saying there. We should be that kind of people. That's the sign of a healthy church. The sign of a genuine church is that the word of God is preached. The sign of a healthy church is that the people are hungry for the word of God. There's a real deep desire to just give our lives over to what the scripture says. There's a deep desire in the the believer when the believer is healthy in Christ, when the church is healthy, there's a deep desire to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. We've got to come to the word of God. Colossians 3.16, which I just quoted, means that. We've got, it's not simply that the word of God just suddenly makes an appearance in our hearts and in our minds. We have got to be the kind of people who are absolutely devoted to the Bible. And I've said before here, and I'm sure I'll say it again, if you love him, if you love God, you you love what God says. If you love Jesus Christ, surely we are devoted not only to Jesus Christ, but we're devoted to every word he utters. Because you see, in the word of God there is life. In the word of God, there is power. In the word of God, there is freedom. The word of God has the power to break every chain. The word of God has the power to set the captives free. The word of God has the power to mold you and me and make us like the Lord Jesus Christ. The power of the word of God is to make us more like our Savior. We need to hunger for that. We need to be the kind of people who are devoted to the word individually and corporately as the people of God. We need to be devoted to the Word of God because the Word of God guides us in the next step that we should take. Oh, how sad it is when we become believers and we put the Bible to the side now that we're saved and we don't open the Scripture. How sad it is when you appear in a church and you see that the Bible is closed and put to the side, that the Bible passage is read and it's put down. And then the pastor or the preacher goes on and he tells you what he thinks about this and about that. And this is what we need. We need to be devoted to the word of truth. We need to be the kind of people who want more than what we've just received. Is that how we are tonight? When you read the scriptures and you close your Bible at the end of that, do you want more? And I know it's about time as well, but forget the time thing. I don't have the time. You've got the word. Don't you want more of it? Of course we do. We don't just want five minutes with Jesus every day. We want it to be a meaningful five minutes, if that's all we can afford. If if our lives are so busy that we can only give Jesus five minutes, we want that five minutes to be deep and meaningful. And none of you, none of you are going to put your hand up and admit to giving Jesus five minutes. Liz, I thought you were putting your hand up there. (laughs) Liz, my heart just sank. Liz wasn't putting her hand up. People, she was, I think she was scratching her head. Thank the Lord. We need more. We need to be totally given over to the truth. It guides us. This beautiful light of the word of God leads us down that road that we are meant to be on. The word of God shines and shows us the pitfalls and potholes. The word of God is the lamp, isn't it? The word of God is the lamp that leads us. The word of God is filled with a life that I need and you need. We need to be nourished. Well, we're nourished with the word of God. We have to to savor the word of God. Well, the early church were clearly healthy at this point. They wanted the word of God. They gave themselves over. 
You see, it's not a superficial thing, is it, when you, when you love the Scriptures? It's, it's not a, a superficial uh, thing. It's a, de- it's a profound devotion. It's like... I sometimes think there are people, present company excluded, but I sometimes think there are people who treat their spirituality or their Christianity like going to Tesco or Aldi, Lidl, wherever it is you go. And they go and they say, when they're reading the scriptures, I'll have that. Don't like that so much. I'll have that. You know what I mean? You've heard that illustration, I'm sure, from other people. The supermarket view of Christianity, the supermarket view of the word. You only pick the things you want. It's like almost like you've got the, the shopping list on the PC and it's the same things all the time. And you don't really need to think too much about it because you see, you go through the Bible and you only look at the things you, that you know you enjoy. But that isn't the way it is. It's not about picking and choosing. It's about a complete surrender to the Word of God. I want Zion Baptist Church to continue to be what it has been surrendered to the word of truth. A church that knows the scripture and hungers for more of the scripture. You see, you need to get that into your heads when I'm preaching like this. I know that this is how Zion has been. I'm not trying to say to you, You need to change and become like this. I know you're a church. And now we are a church that loves the word of God. Through the week I was speaking about the almond tree. And the blooming of the almond tree. How God had planted that life in the almond tree. And now we're we're waiting to see with anticipation the almond tree bursting into bloom. But God had planted that life in the almond tree. The life of God has always been in this almond tree. We are anticipating the latest bursting forth of life. The word of God has always been important in this church. May it always be. May we always be the kind of Christians who love the word of God. God said to Joshua, this book of the law, meaning the word of God, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. That's what it means to be devoted to the word of God, Joshua 1.8. It's about having it in our minds, having it in our hearts, mulling it over through the day. You go through your day and and what you've been reading in the morning or the previous night still rumbles around in your head. It's still in your heart. Well, it's beautiful when God grabs you with a scripture and he won't let you go. And every time you turn your head that way, that's the scripture that you've been thinking about. And you turn your head that way and there it's there and you hear it being quoted. And and that is a beautiful thing. That's a wonderful place to be when God is giving you a scripture. God is showing you his word and you just, it's always there. And you're praying it over, you're talking about it with other people, you're thinking about it, you're doing your ordinary daily business, and you're thinking about what God has been saying. Isn't that a blessed place? That's that's devotion to the Word of God. That's not just reading the Bible, that is being devoted to to what God says. Being devoted to the apostles' doctrine 
pursuing the word, pursuing what God says about it, whatever it is at that particular moment. Because you see, if we are like these people, devoted to the doctrine of the apostles, it means every aspect of our life comes under the authority of the Bible. Scripture, the Word of God, is the sole authority for matters of life and faith. That doesn't leave anything else. Give me a subject that is not part of either life or faith. It's not possible. The Bible dictates how we look at things, how we deal with things, what it means for us. Oh, hallelujah. We don't need to ask Oprah. We don't need to ask all these agony aunts and agony uncles what they think about our lives. We have Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ speaks to us. We need to be devoted to this word. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. It's what Paul said in Ephesians 2.20 about the building of the church. Because you see, we're about the building of the church in Zion Baptist Church. We're about the, 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 the development of the church. We're about the world seeing this church and seeing what it's like to be the people of God. We want people to look at us and see God and see the glory of God in Jesus Christ. Paul says in Ephesians 2.20 that such a church is built upon the foundation of the apostles with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone, chief cornerstone. In other words, the teaching of Scripture, the teaching of the apostles is radically Christ-centered. And so if we are devoted to the apostles' doctrine, it means we are devoted to hearing instruction, reading instruction about Jesus Christ, of being pointed to Jesus all the time. That's why we should be devoted to the Bible, because it points to Jesus. It speaks of Christ. It doesn't speak of man as king or prince or leader. It speaks of Christ. It doesn't speak of man being the builder of the church. It tells us that Jesus Christ is the builder of the church. We don't read in Matthew that I, you will build my church. It tells us I will build my church, says Jesus. It is firmly fixed on Christ. He tells the disciples that the whole scripture, the whole scripture speaks about him. The road to Emmaus and the two on the road to Emmaus. Jesus, from all the scripture, opened up what they said about him. What else is there? Tradition? Only when tradition comes under the authority of the word of God. Never the other way around. Never the other way around. The church thrives. This church will thrive into the future as we continue to be devoted to the teaching of the apostles because when the church is Christ-centered, God honors that. God blesses a fellowship that is fixed on Jesus. And so Luke encourages in these verses a focus on apostolic truth, constant commitment. I could speak forever about the Word of God. You must know that already. I could, I was going to say I could, I would run the risk of Sending you to sleep, speaking about the Word of God. No, yet.
But I love this. Do you not love it? Don't have the Bible as an idol. We love God. Not the Bible. As if the Bible's just some book. I love God, you love God, we love Jesus, absolutely adore Jesus, and we love what Jesus says. It's life for us. Let it never depart from us. It is our lives. So a healthy church in the 21st century mirrors the healthy church in the first century, continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. But the second hallmark, what is that just the first hallmark? <laughs> We're now on to the second hallmark. But the second hallmark comes out of being devoted to the word of God. And the second hallmark is fellowship. Not only were they devoted to the word, but they were devoted to fellowship. Some translations say the fellowship. Well, both meanings are legitimate. If we are dedicated to the scriptures, then we are dedicated to what the scripture teaches. And the scripture teaches that we as the people of God should be in close and deep fellowship. And that means our devotion should flow from the word of God, devotion to the word of God, into a devotion for fellowship, a devotion for the fellowship. There's nothing superficial about being a Christian. Nothing at all. If we are to be healthy Christians, part of a healthy church, then we should be given over to one another. Maybe that doesn't excite you when you look up here and see the state of my ugly mug. But you have to be devoted to me. Just like I'm devoted to you. Marvelous when we can look at brothers and sisters and say, My heart is devoted to you and your well being. We're thinking a little bit about that this morning. Committed to Christ centered teaching means that we're also committed to a Christ centered life. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 3. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We want to tell you about Jesus Christ. We want to tell you about what we have seen and heard and handled. And because we're telling you about what we've seen and heard and handled, it brings you into fellowship with us because we enter together into this beautiful experience of Jesus Christ. It's brilliant when you are in your prayer closet and you can experience that moment when you break into the presence of God and you know that you've reached the throne. That's beautiful. How much more beautiful, how much more glorious when the body of believers enter together into that fellowship, enter together into that place of blessing. That's what we're called to. You see, you're called as a believer, you're called as an individual Christian, but there is no such thing as radical individuality in the Christian church. We are called as individuals, we are blessed as individuals, we live with Christ as individuals, but never so much so that we do not do the same 
corporately, that our, our heart's desire should be that every member of Zion Baptist Church walks in intimacy with Christ all of the time, that we enjoy that fellowship with him, oh yes, but we're enjoying that fellowship with one another. I don't know your political persuasion, but I'll tell you this, in the Christian church, there is no such thing as independence. There is only interdependence, where we are dependent upon one another. We only have a sense of oneness when we are all involved in that oneness. We don't want barriers, we don't want hindrance, we don't want obstacles, we don't want brokenness in the relationship of the fellowship with each other. We want unity. We want a, 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 a not a radical individualism, but a radical unity where we all together are loving Christ together, singing his praises. I'm preaching to the converted. So let me ask you, converted, do you feel it, brothers and sisters? Do you feel a desire in your heart tonight to be close to Christ with one another? That's true fellowship. That's the fellowship that we are meant to express. We, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. That's what Paul says in Romans 12 and verse 5. Precious interconnectedness. We're interwoven. Interwoven. That means when one hurts, the other's hurt. When one grieves, we're all grieving. When one rejoices, we're all rejoicing. When one gains a victory over whatever it is they've been struggling with, the whole fellowship enters into that victory and rejoices with them and praise, praises God together with them. Is there a more precious existence than that on earth? If you think there is a more precious existence on earth, well, I know you don't. I'm talking to folks that maybe don't know us. If you don't know that this is the most precious existence and you think there is something more, Wow, heaven's going to challenge you to your socks. Because when we get home to glory, we will be one. We will be together for all eternity, singing the same hymns, all singing from the same hymn sheet, focused on the same Savior, Thanking him for the same blood. Didn't it take more blood to save you than it does to save anyone else? Precious fellowship. Oh, let it begin before we get home. Let us be the kind of people that are absolutely devoted to the teaching of the Word of God because it teaches us about fellowship one with another. It draws us into that place where we want to be together. I want to be together with you. Surely. And there are brothers and sisters outside of the church tonight. I don't even mean outside of this building. I mean outside of the church. But they are brothers and sisters. And they don't know it. But do you know this? The day is coming when we will be so interlinked with them that it's going to be overwhelming. 
That day is coming, and Zion will enter into that experience because that is what God wants in this fellowship. Devotion to truth, devotion to fellowship with one another, a unity that is a precious thing. Jesus says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. John 13, 35. So if you don't want this spiritual unity and you don't want this spiritual fellowship, there's something amiss. There's something lacking. So when the, what the apostle says here, when Luke says here, they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. He means this fellowship one with the other, but he means more than that. He means fellowship with Christ, yep. Yeah. We'll see that in a minute. But he means something other than that as well. He means that they were devoted to the expression of the church in which they had been placed. You see, 3,000 people weren't told, now go and find a church. Go and find a group of people. We're told in verse 41 that they were added to the church. In other words, Almighty God knew exactly what he was doing, placing them where he placed them. And when they were devoted to fellowship, it includes being devoted to the fellowship. Well, I make absolutely no apology for this. Well, I do. But the Lord sorted it. These mad Calvinists, they were out in Sucky Hall Street again. That's you lot, by the way. You mad Calvinists out in Sucky Hall Street. I used to hear things like that. Not at Springburn so much, but when I was at college, I didn't know anything other than I knew about Jack Glass. I didn't know anything else. Then I met somebody, my dear friend, Peggy, and I got to know Zion almost immediately through you. And here's the thing, I am absolutely devoted to this fellowship. This is my church. You thought it was your church, I know. <laughs> Do you feel that for this place? Utterly devoted to fellowship and to this expression of it. This is where God put us, you see. That's what I'm, I saw what all that blethering was about. That, God has put us here, and the reason God has put us here and is, is over the last few weeks and months maybe has been drawing out this idea of being united one with the other is because God wants us to be committed to one another, to be committed to his word, to be committed to Christ, to be committed to this place and do whatever we need to do here in this place to build up our brothers and sisters so that they become strong and even more committed to Zion than they've ever been before. Is that not a wonderful calling from God? That's your ministry here in this church. Your ministry is to cement everyone else in their place. As long as God allows them to be cemented, God might have something else for some other people elsewhere. 
and we say you go with, we've got heavy hearts, but you go and be blessed where God puts you. But we are here, and we are here to see Zion develop, and to see Zion multiply and grow, and become a strong and beautiful church. People listening in will be thinking, he's a madman. A healthy Christian and a healthy church are marked by the hallmarks of the word and the hallmarks of fellowship. But then there's another hallmark, a third hallmark, which flows out of fellowship and is an expression of fellowship. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and of, in breaking of bread. They were devoted to the breaking of bread. Devoted to the Lord's Supper and what it means. That's a natural outflow of fellowship. It's an example of the unity that we share. It represents the ultimate display of fellowship. Which is why we break bread the way we do which is why we break bread with believers and which is why we will not break bread with those who don't know Jesus Christ, those who are not walking with him. We can't break bread with other churches who perhaps do not believe the gospel, who don't hold to the truth. There is no fellowship with these people. Not making judgments, I'm just making a statement. We do not have fellowship in the breaking of bread. We don't demonstrate that union because there is none. But when we come together like our church, when we come together with those other churches who love the Lord Jesus, who hold to the doctrines that we hold to, who love Jesus Christ like we love him and walk with him, we can break bread. Because we're showing a unity together, a union with one another. We've just been taking the Lord's Supper. And when we take the cup and when we take the bread, and we're affirming that we are connected to Jesus Christ. Individually, we're saying, I am one for whom he died. When we take the bread and the cup, we're, we're declaring that I have a part in the Savior. And can it be that I should have an interest in the Savior's blood? And so we're talking about ourselves. We're, we're declaring personally and individually, yes, what's happened at Calvary happened for me. But we're not taking the Lord's Supper simply as individuals. We're taking the Lord's Supper together. And we're declaring our communion with Christ personally, but we're also declaring our union and communion with those around us who are also taking the Lord's Supper. And we're declaring to the world, Jesus died for us. The blood that Jesus shed, he shed for us. The blessings of the gospel are for us and we enter together into this and we take bread together to demonstrate that you and I are intimately connected spiritually. Is that not beautiful? The Lord's Supper is for me to declare my part in Christ. Yeah, but thank the Lord it's about us declaring our part together in Christ. 
precious fellowship. I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. After supper he took the cup. All of us are to eat. All of us are to drink. Because Jesus knows that all of us together are together in him. There's unity in Jesus Christ. There's no unity elsewhere. Unity is not about organization. It's not about denomination. It's not about this banner or that banner or this or this group or that group that claim that, that we will go forward and all these groups will get together and we'll go forward and we'll show the world how united we are while we're all believing different things. But you see, that's not unity. And you cannot break bread. Why? Because there's no unity. There's no communion. But when we take communion, when we take the bread and the cup, we're telling the world, see these people that I'm sitting here with. We are all together in love with Jesus. And we all love him in the same way. And we all believe the same things. And we've all been touched by the same Savior. And we've all had the same truth opened up to us. And we've all had the same experience of realizing Jesus Christ is my Savior. Jesus Christ is our Savior. And so we can come together and praise his holy name and let our hearts explode in worship. Because why? We all feel the same thing. Because we're all part of the same body. And when we take the bread and the cup, we're, we're demonstrating that. We're telling the world that. We're letting them know that not only do I participate in the body of Christ, we all together. Unity. The unity of the word, the unity seen in fellowship, unity declared around the Lord's table. Love for him and love for one another. But there's a fourth hallmark, and that's the hallmark of prayer. Continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And that flows as well. That's a, an outflow of our commitment to Christ. It's an outflow of Christ-centered teaching. It's an outflow of fellowship. It's an outflow of being together around the elements. We pray for one another. You are so important to your brother or your sister that the brother or sister prays for you. Devoted to prayer. Oh, that's not what it says, but we'll, we'll hold on to prayer for a minute. Devoted to prayer. We should be the kind of people who are always wanting to speak to God through Jesus Christ. We should be throwing up the, the you know, you, you know the, the little prayers, the, the quick prayer up to God. At that moment, you need help or you're, you're in a situation and you throw a prayer up to Almighty God with confidence that that prayer, stumbling though it might be, has reached the throne room. Why? Because you're praying that prayer through your communion with Christ. That's brilliant when we can do that. It's brilliant when we can receive a phone call or a text message as we do in this church. Will you pray for this one or that one? Will you pray for this situation? 
Oh, and by the way, it seems that Andy's coming on a bundle already. But we pray for one another. I pray for you because I know you will pray for me. I pray for you way beyond that. Way beyond that. Not simply that I know you'll pray for me. I pray for you because I love you in Christ. And I know that that feeling comes back to me. I've experienced it from this fellowship already. We pray for one another. We, 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 we are committed to being in that prayer closet. If two or three of you on earth agree about anything, if, if you agree on earth about anything, you have it. Because where two or three are gathered, I'm right there. But you see, that's a, an even more precious dynamic to prayer. You pray. I pray. We pray for one another. But there's a precious dynamic when the saints of God come together and pray. Where two or three, my goodness, when 22 and 23, there he is in the midst. You see, there's a, a power in the corporate prayer room. A power to strengthen and to heal. A power to set free. Because you and I have been in prayer meetings here in Zion where the corporate body has entered in to the prayers of the person who's praying at that moment. And we have entered into that prayer and been ministered to and blessed by the prayers of our brothers and sisters. Because you see, when we are able to say amen to the prayers that we have heard, it's not because we've heard those prayers. It's because by our spirit, we have entered in to what that person has been praying. Because as a corporate body, the Holy Spirit has been praying on our behalf through that individual. And we are able to say amen to what's been prayed. That's a power that's not present when we're praying on our own. Precious and beautiful though that is. That's not a power that's present when we are praying for one another. Beautiful though that is. That's a power when we're together. Unity in prayer. You see, when the people of God are devoted to the word of God, they become devoted to the fellowship. And when they're devoted to the fellowship, they become devoted to every expression of fellowship around the Lord's table and in the prayer room. We are showing God we are together. Our hearts are knit as one. And this request that we lift to you, God, comes from every single one of us. Isn't it good to be a Christian? Isn't it wonderful to belong to a church that prays? A church that's eager to pray? Where there's not just the pastor and somebody else? I told you that, didn't I? It's a prayer, it's a prayer meeting I was at elsewhere. And it was me and Rob McVicker. Do you know something? He made me preach. <laughs> I had to preach a word while Rob sat there. And then we prayed together. <sighs> but you see, when there's a gathering of God's people, how precious is that? When we come together on a Wednesday or a Friday or whenever it is, Sunday through the day, 
when people come together to pray. People are coming together with a heart that wants the same thing. And God's power is unleashed when we do that. We've got a wonderful future ahead of us. A wonderful future. Because we are devoted to the word of God. We are devoted to fellowship. We do want that, don't we? We are discerning, not simply our own relationship with Christ at the Lord's Supper, but the body of Christ. And we are a prayerful church. Let us not get too big for our boots, though. Because complacency and pride kills it all. We are these things because we rely completely upon Jesus Christ, utterly given over to him. We are devoted to Scripture because it's Christ-centered. We are devoted to fellowship because it's about fellowshipping with Christ. We are devoted to the Lord's Supper because it is a remembrance of Christ. And we are devoted to prayer because we are speaking to Christ. Zion, on we go. May those be our, our hallmarks as we go forward. Heavenly Father, we, we praise your blessed name tonight. We thank you, Lord God, that as we look into the, to the rest of that ch chapter, we see demonstrations of the power of God being unleashed through this devoted church. We see a sharing of possessions. We see miracles being performed. We see the glory of Almighty God being evident. Father, this is what we pray for Zion as we go forward. May those precious hallmarks be impressed upon us so that not even when others look at us, but when you look at us, you see a faithful church. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for your eternal glory. May we praise him with overflowing hearts in Jesus' name. Amen.